Today's first reading is from the 18th chapter of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaths of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread and you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. And then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 15 responsibly. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy day? Go to the city of the angels' side, and give your sight, and seek the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do, they do not do evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. They do not cite the wicked or rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. Our second reading is from the first chapter of Colossians. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in the fleshy body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue secretly established, securely established, and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Now I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known all great, all known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. Uh, I'd like to uh, have all the children come up.
you know, even all, I got all this stuff, I'm still missing the most important thing. I can't do anything without my cotton pen. So even though I got all this cool stuff going on, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the topic, I don't just to you. <laughs> but you know, you know, it would be a, a, a taco like this and me forgetting it still me. It's kind of like everyday life. We have to remember the most important. Like my taco. <laughs> so when, when we go when we go out into the into the suite, and you know it's nice, it's nice to have things to do. It's nice to go to your friend's house, it's nice to play games, go swimming, uh, do all that kind of fun stuff. But we need to remember, we need to remember about the most important thing. And that is to remember life. Every day. Because he is the most important. Without Jesus, all that other stuff really doesn't matter. And so like all this other stuff I have, it doesn't matter because I don't have a taco. But in life, you can do all that other fun stuff, but without Jesus, because he is the most. When we leave here today, um, does Jesus go with us or does he stay here at church? He goes with us, doesn't he? Absolutely. He's with us all. And tomorrow, tomorrow's Monday, I'll still remember, oh yeah, I was in church yesterday, and Jesus, I'll think of Jesus. But then come Friday, by Friday, I'm like, woo it's Friday, I'm out of here. Sometimes I forget all about Jesus. But he's always there with me. And he is the most important. All the other stuff we do is fun. by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please Grace and peace to you in the name of the triune God. Amen. So our gospel lesson this morning picks up right where we left off last week. And as you recall, last week we read that parable of the compassionate Samaritan, or the good Samaritan. And that parable really challenged us and charged us into action, right? The, the last verse of that lesson was, go and do likewise. Jesus was really challenging and calling us into action. Everybody, we even left with a little piece of paper that identified either a specific person or a group that this last week we were going to take action on behalf of. I haven't heard too many reports 
about what you all might have done, but I'd love to hear um, something that you, you might have done. I tallied all those results, and it was, it was fascinating. Uh, I left a little pie chart on my desk, but I'll, I'll bring it next week so you can see where everybody else was kind of thinking who they would serve. Who was that person they saw in that proverbial ditch that they were going to help? So now, the next story that we're presented with in Luke chapter 10 is this encounter with Mary and Martha. I have an older sister. I understand this little, I think, sisterly debate going on here. Right, but we're, we're, we're given this encounter with them, and seemingly, Jesus does like a 180. And he's lifting up that sitting at Jesus' feet and being still and listening is the better part. At least I think we've commonly interpreted this Mary Martha passage this way. That contemplation and reflecting, studying and listening is superior to that of action and doing. But I think any interpretation that makes discipleship this either or situation perhaps is not a correct or the most helpful interpretation that we can make. And at very worst, this Mary Martha encounter has been interpreted, you know, to correct the, the idle busyness of women. <laughs> Corrective from Jesus to Martha is not over her, her busyness and the work that she's doing and serving. It's over her distraction and her worry that these things are pulling her away from Jesus. These things are the things that are occupying her mind over that of discipleship. Most definitely in this passage, Jesus is highlighting the capability of women to be disciples. Did you notice in Luke 10 there, it is said that this was Martha's home. In a world and a culture where women didn't own anything, in fact, women were the property that was owned, this was Martha's home. Of course, as the owner of that home, she wanted to serve as host and take care of Jesus. And Mary is elevated to be desired to be at the feet of Jesus. Women were invited to sit at the feet of a teacher and learn. Women were supposed to be in the kitchen serving. But here Jesus elevates both of these women. Jesus desires them to be in his circle of disciples. We hear a lot about the 12 men. And that close-knit circle. But the circle was even wider than that. Jesus desired these women to be there and to learn and to go on and teach the things he was teaching them well after he was gone. But so we're left, I think, still with this question. Well, what's more important then? Contemplation and reflection or action and doing? Which one is it? Just tell us, Jesus. So I think this section of Luke 10... I think it invites us to think about true discipleship as a balance of both. One cannot distract or pull away from the other. Without contemplation, our action becomes, oh, so tired. Without knowing why we're doing what we're doing, we're liable to just tire out and really become inactive. And without action, our contemplation becomes just empty words and idle profession of faith that doesn't ever actually show any mercy or compassion. We are in this season of Pentecost. We have green banners and pyramids. I get to wear my green Chuck Taylors. <laughs> right, but we're in this season where our spiritual lives are challenged to grow, to be stretched, to be challenged. We are challenged to grow and bear fruit for a hungry world. To become disciples that are loving and compassionate and merciful. So there is no mistake to be made that our scriptures are highlighting a theme of hospitality. 
Sometimes it seems like these Old Testament passages just kind of come out of left field, and why are we reading this today? But if you go back and read that Genesis 18 passage, it's all about hospitality. Right? In the Old Testament world, there was no Holiday Inn Express with Texas-shaped waffles. I, I know, as good as those are, there wasn't there. There was no Airbnb, right? It was up to the residents of that town to welcome in strangers, to feed them, to shelter them, to keep them safe. Hospitality was absolutely critical. And so this is why that Genesis passage highlights what Abraham and Sarah did for the, for, for the Lord, for those messengers from the Lord. It's not just about describing a nice meal that they had with people, but it's about showing the length's choice flower. They went and got the cat, the best, the most tender. An incredible measure of hospitality. For thousands of years, people of faith, and we as people of faith, have been called to this measure of hospitality. And Abraham and Sarah give us a very fine example of what it means to receive a stranger and take care of them. We are to be in constant discernment as we are, how, how are we called to act out our faith? When are we being called into contemplation? And for each of us, I think that's going to look a little bit differently. But when we find our actions so involved with being exclusionary, bound to worry about our own self-sustainment, I think perhaps then it is time to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. And then go back out, renewed with a sense of who we are and renewed with a sense of in whose name we go out and serve. And when our contemplation causes us to be so still, to give us blinders that we can't see the neighbor around us that is in need, it's time to get to work. It's time to go out and go and do likewise. This is our life's work as Christian people. And I suppose we could either feel burdened by that and see it as a sense of obligation and this is what I have to do. Or we could see this as this is our joy as people of faith. Jesus has told us that we are worthy to be at his feet. Jesus has told us that we are empowered to go out in his name to go and share the love and grace and mercy of God to the places that he would have gone himself. Jesus willingly wants to be with us. Jesus willingly wants us to be with him, to be a part of the telling and the showing, the contemplating and reflecting on the love that he has for the whole entire world, that he has for you, that he has for me, for all of humanity. So I think we are invited into these questions this morning. Where is God calling you? Where is God calling me? What are ways that we have experienced the love and mercy and grace of God so that we can go out and share that with the whole world? Food for thought this week. We'll sing hymn 759, and I invite you to stand as you are able. 